Okay, good morning everybody. Um, so welcome to the final day of our conference and of course the final plenary. Um, I must say I feel as if I've been waiting for this particular uh, event since uh, the very beginning of Evil Lang back in 1996. Um, the first words coined uh, by any human were not coined by city dwellers or farmers, but of course by hunter-gatherers at a time when all of us lived the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And um, it seems to me so important that we constrain our narratives by having at least some knowledge of the core stable features of immediate return egalitarian hunter-gatherers. And really, although uh, our speaker this morning will probably uh, kind of be a bit cross with me for saying this, he, he doesn't really promote himself in that way, uh, I don't know any hunter-gatherer ethnographer with more extraordinary uh, experience, in-depth experience over many, many years and many even decades um, than Jerome Lewis. Um, and he's not just an academic, um, uh, and possibly that's one of the reasons why perhaps many of you have never really heard of, of Jerome Lewis. You probably haven't heard of Jerome, of the Jerome Lewis, who is the um, sub-aqua um, rugby player representing the United Kingdom in uh, aquatic rugby, or the um, spearfisher. Um, and um, among other things, he's an enormously um, passionate activist. Um, um, so he's um, co-director of the Extreme Citizen Science Research Group, making science and its techniques and recording facilities available to non-literate non people, particularly hunter-gatherers in different parts of the world, and co-director of the Centre for the Anthropology of Sustainability. And of course many of these activities, I just can't understand how Jerome can be doing so many different things, how many different um, Jerome Lewis's there, there are. Anyway, this is going to be a very um, interesting and amazing talk. And please join with me in welcoming uh, Jerome Lewis. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. And of course, to our wonderful hosts, Lavomir and Chamek, and all the helpers who've been so wonderful in making this a very smooth conference uh, and, uh, and taking us out and showing us such a good time in this beautiful city of Torun. Um, a first little point I'd just like to make is that although I use this distinction, music and language, uh, in the talk, it's just a heuristic device. Of course, in real situations, music and language intertwine in many, many ways. Uh, and many of the examples I'll be giving you of people's use of language or music will mix uh, quite uh, liberally different aspects of both these uh, uh, extremes of what uh, Ian Cross usefully calls the human communicative spectrum. And I'd also like to emphasize that uh, gesture and phonation are part and parcel of the same communicative act. So as I'm using my hands now to gesture to you as I speak, when people make music, of course, their bodies respond through musical gestures. And as far as I'm concerned, playing a piano is just as much a musical gesture as dancing, nodding your head, or tapping your feet. So I'm really using these as heuristic devices in order to be able to focus in on particular uh, types of human communicative behavior that are of interest to us here. So, music and language evolved among African hunter-gatherers, but such groups' use of music and language have been strangely absent in theorizing about the origins of these activities. And their points of view on these issues are rarely taken into account. What I want to do today is try and remedy this omission and propose that taking their views and practices into account suggests that singing, which respects costly signaling constraints, must have evolved first. Once practiced by a social group, singing has clear survival advantages when used to ward off dangerous animals that women and children still use and still talk about today. This insight is taken to suggest that chorusing groups of early hominins established a unique social context in which certain prerequisites of language could evolve, 
in particular vocal dexterity, vocal learning, hyperimitation, we intentionality, group-wide trust or a platform of trust, and eventually a normative space of shared values. It's only in such a context that increasing iconicity could involve, evolve without resistance from conspecifics into symbolism that no longer respects costly singling constraints. So there are four main reasons that I think African hunter-gatherers offer uh, special insight into the conditions facing modern uh, evolving humans uh, than any other groups. And those are environmental, social, genetic, and cultural. And I'll deal with each in turn. So the environmental context. Homo sapiens originated in Africa and have lived in Africa for about three times longer than anywhere else in the world. The African environment is therefore more relevant for understanding the key factors affecting human evolution. Uh, contemporary hunter-gatherers are still closely dependent on this environment and of particular significance in the context of my argument today is the role played by large predators and other dangerous animals in human evolution. Consider feline predators with superb night vision, such as lions. The Joubert's working in Botswana using night vision technology realized that 80% of lion kills uh, occur in the darkest hours of the night. Lions are extremely sensitive to the uh, moon, simply giving up hunting once the moon rises because their prey will be able to see them come close. Similarly, examining reports of attacks on over a thousand Tanzanians between 1988 and 2009, in which two-thirds of the victims were killed and eaten by lions, uh, Craig Packer and colleagues note that the success rate varied strikingly with the moon phase, because lions prefer to attack at night in complete darkness. Our African hominin ancestors co-evolved with nocturnal feline predators during six million years. The ecological niche of early Pleistocene hominins included a formidable community of at least 12 species of saber-toothed cats, eight species of other felines, and nine hyena species. Packer and colleagues remind us that we have always been exposed to risks of predation that cycled with the waxing and the waning of the moon. Being relatively small and vulnerable with poor night vision, hominins must have faced severe risks of predation when moving around on the open ground. For millions of years, whether along shorelines or deep inland, the nocturnal threat posed by big cats at dark moon must surely have influenced the human need for group living and the mastery of fire and our innate fear of darkness. The very fact that hominins began living in increasingly large groups is attributed, of course, to predation pressure. The social context. James Woodburn, in 1982, elucidated the core structural features of assertively egalitarian, immediate return hunter-gatherer, political and economic organization. And he showed that these are globally consistent. Members of such groups consume most of their food on the day that they produce it. They reject private property. They move to avoid conflict rather than fight. Uh, they don't depend on specific others for access to land, uh, key resources, weapons, or tools. A range of mechanisms, most centrally demand sharing, ensure that valued goods circulate without making people dependent on one another. People who brag, try to claim status or assert authority, um, are mercilessly teased, mocked, and avoided if necessary. Although such societies are rare today, um, they exist uh, all over the world. They, they include some pygmy groups in Central Africa, Hadza in Tanzania, San groups in Botswana and Namibia, and several groups in India, such as the Jarawa or the Sentinelese in the Andaman Islands, uh, and in Southeast Asia, the Agta, the Batek, the Manik, and the Penang, and others. The global distribution of these, this social structure suggests that such, human, uh, human, uh, such social systems are highly stable and successful adaptations, whose key elements predate human migrations out of Africa. Theorizing about early modern humans should take these core traits into account. The third element is the genetic context. Shared ancient genetic markers connect the four major groups of immediate return African hunter-gatherers, the Khoisan in southern Africa, western and eastern pygmies in the forests of central Africa, and a very small relic population of Hadza in east Africa. 
Recent research into their genetics allows us to track the time depth of their separation into distinct lineages. It's probable that they all descend from an original proto Khoisan pygmy group uh, living somewhere in sub Saharan Africa well before the major dispersal of modern humans outside the continent. The fourth element is the cultural context. Based on the ethnography from the contemporary descendants of these African lineages, Camilla Power has elucidated the likely Middle Stone Age cultural features relating to cosmology and patterns of gendered ritual common to Khoisan, Pygmies, and Hadza. The logic of seeking safety in numbers uh, at night predicts that our ancestors would form the largest assemblies precisely during the monthly period when of greatest danger around Dark Moon. And Power finds that the lunar cosmology appears to be an ancient common feature shared by African hunter-gatherers, with important ritual gatherings still occurring today at no moon, and symbolic interaction between the spheres of production and reproduction infused with lunar symbolism. These symbolic oppositions have resulted in a distinctive gender division of labor and a system of prohibitions based on keeping the blood of hunting separate from the human, that of human fertility and a suite of rituals in which gendered norms reverse, and with reverse dominance being periodically ri ritually enacted by women in relation to men. Given these continuities in our African origins, I'm going to focus particularly on the Bayaka pygmies with whom I've been doing research since 1994. They're a highly resilient egalitarian group whose contemporary adaptation to hunting and gathering in Central Africa is suggestive of principles relevant for understanding the evolutionary relationship between music and language. The greatest number of uh, hunter-gatherers in the world exist today in Central Africa. And I'm going to be dividing the uh, eastern groups, who I'm going to just call the Mbuti pygmies as a, a, as a generic term, and the western groups, who I'm going to be calling the Bayaka, which is their generic term, for, for themselves. I've actually been working with this group, the Bambenjele, for, uh, for the past 25 odd years. Um, and I'll, I'll, at one point I'll just refer to the Aka and the Baka that you can see here who are living next to each other and I just point that out so that you'll, you'll know who I'm referring to. So despite the great diversity of situations that many pygmy groups find themselves in today, they share remarkable similarities. Most notable here is that they have a very unusual, highly integrated, choral, yodeled, polyphonic singing style. Across the region, yodel, and I'll play you some examples of this later, and vocal polyphony together are consistently associated with these gendered rituals that call forest spirits, a cosmology and gendered division of labor based on the opposition between men's bloodletting in hunting and women's bloodletting in reproduction. Forest mobility, Camps composed of these round, dome-shaped huts that you can see in the images, uh, and similar honey-collecting tools, intimate, very intimate pa parent-child relations, and an egalitarian political and economic social order. These elements are too specific to emerge from convergent evolution, and with genetic evidence proving a shared past, appear to be key components of a highly resilient and effective adaptation to forest hunting and gathering. The cultural continuities appear to have ancient roots, given that genetic dating suggests these that their ancestors entered the forest around 54,000 years ago, and the western Bayaka groups separated from the eastern and Mbuti groups 27,000 years ago. Claiming a degree of cultural continuity over such great time spans is not to deny change, but rather emphasizes the remarkable resilience of the core structures organizing these egalitarian societies. From this point of view, assertively egalitarian societies are not primitive, which is a social evolutionary idea originating in justifications for late European colonialism. But rather, they're highly successful adaptations for human living that have survived into the present because they have achieved a sweet spot based on fulfilling human needs without inequality. Such societies' persistence over time without directive institutions or status positions is testimony to the pleasure and the efficacy of such forms of sociality for those living by them, based on personal autonomy, free access to key resources, 
on leveling off wealth inequalities or actively resisting and rejecting claims to status, privilege or, or authority and by structuring key cultural concepts with humor and shared pleasures at their core. Although anyone can address non-conformity using mockery and avoidance, women have the main responsibility for this. By performing humorous reenactments, imitating offenders' behavior to the whole community, women are experts at shaming at the same time as eliciting moral commentaries from onlookers that educate and remind all of their social norms. Bayaka communication, like Bayaka society, is open, encompassing, and inclusive. It's a skillful multimodal deployment of a range of capacities inherent to human bodies that serve to establish relationships with as many creatures as possible. At the musical end, Bayaka po vocal polyphony is predominantly composed of vowel sounds, rarely with lyrics. At the other, in private speech, speakers may routinely contract words by removing all the, con uh, the consonants from the, from the words so that they just speak in vowel sounds. And sometimes they just use sign language or imitate animals to disguise their communications from uh, non-human others. Bayaka interchange vocal and visual signs and symbols ranging from full iconicity to total arbitrariness. These indices, icons, and symbols are copied or mimicked from fellow Bayaka, plants, animals, and other people's languages, or the forest soundscape. And they're recombined according to what they think will, most, will best achieve their communicative aims. So to give you a brief example of what uh, such a, a, a mixing of modes looks like, I'm going to play you a short clip from my friend Mongimba explaining a hunt um, and I won't translate it, it's just so that you can see this combination of speech and, and other uh, styles. Hello, I'm Gimma Mungwene. So, I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about the name of the Lord. Okay, so Bayaka sign and whistle to communicate secretly in the presence of game. They mimic animal vocalizations to call prey to them. They mark plants to guide and inform others coming behind them. And they mimic environmental sounds, as you just saw when recounting events. But they also freely borrow words from other people's languages. They sing to accompany daily activities or beat drums and dance in dense polyphonic rituals that engage the forest by mimicking its own sound back to it, or they establish or to establish dialogue between the camp and their environment. Telling sung fables called Gano combines all these communicative forms to produce immersive reenactments of mythical times. So people here are not simply telling stories, they relive the stories as they tell them. And when you're talking about myths, this provides people with direct access to a, a very deep time consciousness. Um, I'm going to play you one called Sungu A Wi, which means chimpanzee will die. Now chimpanzee is insisting on getting initiated into one of the men's cults. And the people know that the spirit will kill him if he tries. And so they're trying to warn him, don't get initiated. And if you listen to the story, you'll see that some people are telling the story. Other people are singing the songs that go with the initiation. While other people are becoming chimpanzee, trying to get initiated.
communicative strategies that people use serve to maintain multi-species, intercultural and multicultural relationships that reinforce the Bayaka's view of themselves not as subjects in a society outside of nature, but rather as a society of nature. Just as a society of people implies communication and transaction between them, so a society of nature implies communication and transaction between its members. Bayaka communication strategies are precisely developed to achieve this. For them, the forest is always talking to them. Elephant is over there, the monkeys have seen pigs, you hear frogs, it's the forest inviting you to drink. Other species engage similarly, so that, for instance, dikers are drawn to fruiting trees when they hear the colobus calls up at the top. And they know that as the monkeys are greedily shoveling in the fruit, lots will fall down and they can feed underneath. But they also know that when they hear the monkey's alarm call, we've seen a leopard, they've got a chance to escape quickly. Bayaka participate in these interspecies exchanges, just like these other animal species. But they do so in gendered ways. Because of this ideology of sacredness and taboo around blood, it organizes, that organizes the gendered division of labor. Men and women behave in different ways. Men walk in small groups, silently, treading carefully to avoid making noise and seek to sneak up on the animals. By contrast, uh, sorry, and to facilitate this, men will do all sorts of things to call the animals to them. So for instance, uh, if they want to catch diker, they'll do this. <coughs> and the dikers come and run, uh, run towards them. It means come and play in diker. Monkeys, uh, w uh, when they're up in the trees, are very difficult to reach with the crossbows. And so what men will do is they'll mimic the alarm call <coughs> of a fallen infant. So all the big boys come down, where's the, where's the child, where's the child? And they can shoot and get closer to them. If you want to catch crocodiles, very difficult in the very dark marshy uh, uh, water that they inhabit. So you mimic their mating calls. <coughs> and you slowly start to hear them uh, respond and come closer to you. <coughs> when spear hunting large game, men use sign language and bird calls to signal to one another while preparing an ambush. Um, in contrast, women fear attack by dangerous animals when they walk in the forest because they smell of human fertility, exemplified by menstruation. As a result, women prefer to walk in large, boisterous groups with noisy children in tow while yodeling loudly like this. They're explicit that they sing to keep the dangerous animals like leopards away from them or elephants, buffalo and gorilla. When predators such as leopards are trailing the camp or dangerous animals nearby, women will insist on singing through the night. The ever-present forest soundscape is composed of multiple overlapping animal, bird and insect calls. Every creature makes its distinctive contribution and some coordinate with each other, such as cicadas do before the rain, whereas others overlap or intertwine at their own pace and rhythm. When creatures contribute, they do so with their whole bodies, with all their vitality and their might, Bayaka say that the forest likes this, and if the forest is to keep their camp open to food, it must hear good sounds coming from people too. Song, storytelling, laughter, the sounds of children happily playing. <coughs> Just as Bayaka listen to the forest to know about it, they say that the forest is listening to them to know about them. When people want to charm the forest, they turn their part of this conversation into a lively song, a song which involves their whole bodies and mimics the forest back to itself. Using percussion, polyphonic singing, dancing, the Bayaka's ancestors established a particular way of doing this they call spirit play. Each has its characteristic repertoire of melodies, songs and rhythms that summon particular forest spirits into the camp. When the singing group achieves the synergistic harmony or synchrony familiar to good choirs or musicians, the forest shows its pleasure by allowing the mysterious forest spirits to sometimes embodied as leafy dancers, sometimes just an ambiance that you feel, um, into, into the camp. Um, 
These enchant the participants and they further deepen the joy and the profound bonding that they experience. Such singing is explicitly said to soften or charm those that hear it so that they give what is requested. So spirit plays like Malobé or Yeli or Bula demand specific game animals such as elephants or pigs from the forest. Ijengi gives thanks for abundance and so on. Shimha Adom characterized by Aka polyphonic singing in spirit play as pure music because the melody is not subjected to words. Actually, Bayaka songs are not to be understood because of the words they take from human language, but, all the, but through the acoustic form they've adopted based on the forest's language. Their melodies are the forest's words. The intended recipient of these melodic utterances is the forest as an organic whole, which people, spirits, animals and plants are of all part of. By respecting costly signaling constraints in their vivacious ritual singing and dancing, they're able to commune and communicate with the, all the components of the forest, themselves included. In these societies without status positions, such as judges or teachers, musical participation is a major social arena for learning key forest skills, cooperation and group coordination. Musical performances involve a wide range of potential meanings and functions, from the sound, the structure of the music, or the social relationships between the people participating in making the music, or the way it signifies cultural specific concepts uh, or identity. Following Richard Widdis in other work, I've analyzed this style of singing as a foundational cultural schema. Through the performance of spirit plays, non-linguistic cultural models that cross cut diverse cultural realms, such as economics, politics, history, and cosmology, are re-experienced and practiced in a safe environment so they're learnt by each generation. During spirit play performances, the whole camp assembles in gendered groups in the central space, sitting tightly. People are touching, they rest their limbs upon their neighbor's limbs, their arms on their, each other's shoulders. Uh, and as this mass of bodies begins to sing, each person has their own melodic utterance, which they sing out, and it overlays with other people's melodic utterances. And as these uh, melodies intertwine, so their bodies are intertwined, and it's very easy to quickly lose yourself and enter the joy they call isengo. To achieve this, uh, they try and sing more beautifully. And because the beauty is what actually leads you into the joy, uh, they're very explicit about trying to establish this. And they insist that you mustn't argue. There's no shouting. Don't chat. Everyone has to make a, a, a big effort and share whatever they can. In conjunction with a musical education, this, there is a social and a political one. There's no hierarchy during musical performances. Although one may begin a song, anyone else can stop it and start a new one. Everyone is free to joy which, whatever part of the polyphony they wish. To contribute appropriately, one must not drown out one's neighbors or sing the same melody as they do. So listening is as important as singing. If too many <coughs> sing in unison, participants instinctively diverge by choosing alternative melodic lines to maintain the polyphony. Regularly singing like this instills certain ways of coordinating and structuring groups and group activities that are applied outside the spirit play performances. So for instance, the instinctive way that singers avoid unison has economic implications. In an, in a, in a, in, in an egalitarian society, daily hunting and gathering are intuitively coordinated without anyone to order other people's activities. Being musically primed to do something different but complementary to other, others improves the chances that the camp will find food. Similarly, knowing a sufficient range of melodic modules and when to insert them into the song structurally resembles the way environmental knowledge is employed to, <coughs> sorry, is employed to identify and efficiently extract resources from the forest. Musical participation in spirit plays is the main avenue through which Bayaka learn these unspoken grammars of daily interaction. In such ways, learning to sing polyphonically and participating appropriately during performances inculcates particular cultural dispositions and patterns of behavior that are central to reproducing Bayaka hunter-gatherer culture and society. Confirming this, when Bayaka seek to know the extent to which other groups of pygmies are like themselves, they begin by discussing their ritual performances rather than their language. 
judging their accomplishments at singing and dancing, at telling sung fables or public speaking rather than on grammatical form or vocabulary. It's not what repertoire people are singing, but the polyphonic yodeling style they use, not which steps they dance or which spirits they call, but the ritual structures that they employ to do so. Not the language they speak, but how it is spoken. The perception of what it means to be Bayaka is based on an aesthetic quality, in which structure or style matter more than content. Here, language, in a formal sense, is manifestly not synonymous with culture rather, or identity, rather it is the predatory encompassment of any meaningful and efficacious means for communicating that characterizes these hunter-gatherers. Many Bayaka have adopted grammatical structures and extensive vocabulary, even a new language in the Baka case, from non-Bayaka villager neighbors without losing their distinctive identity. Aka and Baka, for instance, see each other as sharing the same origins and culture, despite Akka speaking a Bantu language and Baka speaking a Bangian language. And uh, the, the structural difference between these language families is similar to the difference between, say, English and Persian. But they contrast their Bayaka lifestyles and values to those of their hierarchical villager neighbors, even when the villagers speak the same language as they do. From their perspective, their distinctive socio-cultural aesthetic includes these particular speech and singing styles, a rejection of authority and inequality, a valuation of sharing and autonomy, expertise in big game hunting, and a taste for forest foods above all other food. But just hearing their musical style is enough for them to, is sufficient for them to identify other pygmies. When I played Mbuti music play, recorded in 1958 to Bayaka in Congo in 2010, more than 1,500 kilometers away, Within seconds, they said, ah, they are Bayaka, just like us. And this is surprising because, of course, they've been separated for more than 25,000 years. This implies that the musical style is of considerable antiquity and therefore that the cultural dispositions it primes participants towards are probably refractions of a much more ancient culture. In recent work, Camilla Power has identified further shared features of ritual performance among these remaining African hunter-gatherers. One of the most significant shared areas of ritual performance are highly gendered rituals of reverse dominance, in which women take over the camp. Across all these groups, it is women, not men, that take the lead and dominate the singing during community rituals. More specifically, beginning in the Kalahari, the widespread and likely very ancient Khoisan ritual called the Eland Bull Dance uh, takes place with a girl's first menstruation. Conceived of as an Eland Bull, she is secluded while other women dance around her, playfully mimicking the behavior of an Eland cow soliciting sex with her supernatural bull. The Tanzanian Hadza girl's initiation ritual, Maitoko, involves similar sexual reversal and defiance while bleeding initiates reenact a myth about an ancestral matriarch who dons a zebra's penis. Much like the Eland bull, this male animal enjoys intercourse with its numerous wives. Dressed as hunters, the Maitoko initiates then leave into the camp armed with long sticks to chase young men. In the Congo Basin, both Eastern and Western pygmies have prominent rituals of reverse dominance that play an important role in maintaining gender egalitarianism. The Elima girls' initiation among the Eastern and Buti involves girls becoming hunters and chasing young men with sticks in a very similar fashion to the Hadza. Among the Western Bayaka, women-led reverse dominance rituals are a regular part of life, known as Ngoku. During these lively ritual performances, all the females present join together, mixing beautiful song and dance with raunchy, mocking imitations of male misbehavior in sexual interactions. Conceptualized as women's communal spirit, Ngoku outs out the mythic theme of a primordial time when women lived without men. The outcome of these displays of women's potential to accomplish reverse dominance is the achievement of gender egalitarianism persisting between the ritual performances, supported by much lower intensity counter-dominant behaviors such as mockery or demand sharing. 
Contrary to popular academic stereotypes of egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands that conceive of male hunters serving as the collective alpha, that's from a paper just published in 2017, the ethnography of egalitarian African hunter-gatherers suggests that the reverse is true, that it is women that play the collective alpha role. The ethnographer, ethnography sorry, is more closely respected by Camilla Power's Female Cosmetic Coalition model and Sarah Hurdy's work than it is by these uh, characteri other characterizations. And it's not surprising, since it's females who bear the significant burdens of rearing highly dependent, increasingly juvenile infants. Still today, among these egalitarian groups, women's coalitions are central to ensuring that egalitarianism persists, so that males continue to provision their wives and offspring, rather than rove around seeking other fertile females to impregnate, as other primate males do. By singing and dancing together as one, women speak as one. If one spoke for them as the leader, men might attack her. Or if they spoke all at once, it would be very difficult to understand. But when all sing together, the message is reinforced and repetition strengthens the point rather than tiring listeners. The centrality of these reverse dominance rituals among all the remaining groups of hunt African hunter-gatherers suggests they're of considerable antiquity. This provides a more ethnographically plausible account for the origins of we intentionality than does the theories of primitive warfare. Egalitarian hunter-gatherers avoid or flee conflict rather than engage. They're not aggressively territorial, and without leaders with authority, they have great difficulty in organizing resistance to outside aggression. The notion that warfare or territorial conflict drove the evolution of we intentionality is simply ethnocentric. In our recent article, Wild Voices, Chris Knight and I argue that the coalitionary displays of resistance aimed at large predators are sufficient to build the sense of us as opposed to them. A display of resistance against some external threat while sounding aggressive to outsiders may be heard as comforting and supportive by members of the signaler's own group. Singing, as Power argues, is what Dunbar's vocal grooming had to be if it was to have produced the opiate simulation, stimulation associated with the pleasure of physical grooming. The production of oxytocin in those singing together clearly establishes trust between participants within the coalition. Once the coalition is realized, boundaries can shift. The singing women can redraw it between themselves and the men, or between themselves and a the troublemaker. And Bayaka women still do this today. So you can get a sense of what a display of reverse dominance looks like. I'm going to play you a short film of one. Um, but bear in mind, we've edited the film uh, so that uh, you get a sense of the diversity of different things going on. But actually, the beginning section of the film where the women come in as a group is what most of the time is taken up doing. Uh, and, uh, and they will do this sometimes for eight or nine hours. Uh, they really have an extraordinary energy for this kind of thing.
Кому како? Ока. So I think uh, <laughs> So their communicative practices illustrate the importance of playful mimesis in driving their creative spoken and sung engagement with humans and non-humans. What begins as an index of an animal's state, for instance, when pigs find good food, they go, Hoo! and you can call them to you if you're a hunter by standing behind a tree with one eye closed, and you go, Hoo! and then the greedy male would immediately come trotting up to try and steal the food, and you have a chance, of course, of thrusting your spear in. But once imitated, so when such a Hoo! is imitated by the hunter, it becomes an iconic phonation though it's still heard by the other animal as an index. But when the human hunter returns with his pig and he drops it among the women back in camp and he says, oh. suddenly it has become a symbol. These icons, signs and symbols are copied or mimicked from fellow Bayaka, from plants, animals and other people's languages or the forest soundscape and they're recombined according to what will most effectively achieve particular goals. Sometimes they're intended to provide selective or secretive communication, as when men use sign language or whistle to one another in preparing an ambush for a, an elephant or a herd of pigs. Other times they intend all of them to hear and, uh, uh, and rejoice, as when the whole community sings together. Just as each sex employs different reproductive and productive strategies, so too do they differ in their use of similar propensities for mimicry aimed at outsiders. Men's mimicry focus on, focuses on enabling them to approach animals more easily, whereas women's mimicry keeps animals away. When women redeploy their mimicry within the group, they use it to shame individuals who don't respect the moral order, potentially keeping them away too. Women's mimicry depends on their solidarity for its effectiveness. Their collective action bonds the singing participants. It establishes trust between them and a normative order governing their relations. Such mimicry offers an ethnographically plausible account for what Slavomir and Chlamek nicely termed the platform of trust, and a normative order that can be, can be established so that redirected icons can transform into symbols. By analogy, the gendered use of mimicry by early hominins could have first developed as a means to deceive animals, and only later become a means to communicate between people. Brent Berlin, in his work looking at, at um, onomatopoeia and phonesthesia uh, in determining suitable names for things, suggests, and I quote, that non-arbitrary sound symbolic phonomimetic reference must have had enormous adaptive significance for our hominin ancestors. And the intuitively plausible and metaphorically motivated principles of phonesthesia serve to drive lexicon in general. Ramachandran and Hubbard show that phonesthesia generates lexicon when heard sounds are processed directly into movements of the tongue on the palate. Multimodal mimicry pervades human communicative, uh, communicative practices. The recent work of Perlman and Lupien shows that such processes remain salient even in modern hyperformalized languages. In their experiments, people were able to invent iconic vocalizations to represent actions, objects, and animals that unfamiliar individuals accurately recognized and interpreted. The authors argue, and I quote, that, that this demonstrates how iconic vocalizations can enable interlocutors to establish understanding in the absence of conventions. They suggest that prior to the advent of full-blown spoken languages, people could have used iconic vocalizations to ground a spoken vocabulary with considerable semantic breadth. So in conjunction with the hunter-gatherer ethnography, this provides a suggestive taste of what early language-like behavior might have been like. Of relevance here, uh, I, uh, the work I'm presenting here is put into the context of language evolution in this paper. Um, but of relevance here, we point out that the great ape, great ape patrilocal pattern of dispersal at sexual maturity, what's called male phylopatry, had to be reversed for evolving homo mothers to get the parenting support they needed for human brains to exceed what's called the grey ceiling of around six to seven hundred centiliters that uh, seems to be the primate limit on brain size. By moving away from her natal group on reaching maturity, great ape females are without female support, uh, female relatives who can be trusted to support their, uh, their offspring. 
Without this help, hominin mothers one and a half million years ago, <coughs> excuse me, like great apes today, would risk excessively high levels of stress and infant mortality, making further encephalization very unlikely. Cooperative breeding allowed Homo erectus to increase population sizes even when greatly exceeding this gray ceiling, producing brains twice as lar large as those of chimpanzees. When an evolving hominin mother lets others hold her baby, then selection pressures for two-way right mind reading and triadic structures of joint attention are set up. In the initial stages, as is suggested by Hawkes and her colleagues, uh, grandmother, in the grandmother hypothesis, a mother's close kin were key to this development, driving the, f the evolution of extended female post-reductive uh, lifespans. And this is, of course, incompatible with popular patrilo patrilocal assumptions for hunter-gathering bands. In fact, patrilocality is rare among egalitarian hunter-gatherers. Rather, they exhibit a deep-time bias to matrilocality. And this does suggest that female-dominated groups caring for numerous dependent infants bore the greatest risk of predation. So, as suggested by the Bayaka's own reasons for singing, our ancestors were vulnerable, vulnerable hominins. When they were vulnerable hominins living in open uh, landscape with limited rep uh, weaponry, increasing the diversity and volume of their calls would have been one way to keep nocturnal predators at bay. Fitch and Zuberbühler show that our distinctively human ability to produce pitch variations evolved after we split from our closest primate relatives. And it's quite likely that large felines would have been very re uh, reluctant to approach a noisy group of hominin females and infants if unexpected pitch variations uh, made it difficult to estimate group size. Lionesses do this, interestingly. Uh, they chorus together when they sense another pride coming towards them to warn them away. Some hum other human groups uh, who live in areas with feline predators still do this. Um, the Bayaka, of course, they have a particular ritual where they extinguish all the cooking fires on Dark Moon uh, called Mieti uh, and sing night lo all night long. Similarly, Hadza women uh, extinguish all fires and sing vocal polyphonies through moonless nights each month during their most significant ritual called the Epime. An Indian forest people called the Niligri Urulas uh, say that they sing and dance uh, during Dark Moon to keep uh, dangerous animals away, particularly tigers. Uh, in, the, in the southern Africa, the Khoisan trance dance, uh, which is uh, dominated by women singing and men tending to trance dance, uh, will make noise that can be heard for uh, uh, kilometers around the, the dance site. And uh, um, some ethnographers think that this is quite likely to keep lions away. So the ethnography fits the women and children versus predator hypothesis better than sexual selection for male vocalizers that's been proposed by Björn Murka and Miller um, to, to account for the evolution of music. And we have ancient mythological universals as well uh, that link uh, putting out cooking fire with darkness and the production of loud noises that Levi Strauss identified and predator-prey relations still animate an awful lot of human ritual practices, as some comparative uh, anthropologists have shown. So small groups singing for their lives on dark moonless lights is an evolutionary stable strategy for dealing with predation pressures when group living. Perhaps these are the pra part of the practices that enabled Homo erectus to spread into new habitats and further control their breathing, their phonation, and their articulatory capacities. And this is suggested by the ear canal, uh, that they had an ear canal of modern proportions, which implies that vocal sounds were increasingly significant for them. With the appearance of the ancestor often identified as Homo heidelbergensis, the full modern vocal tract and auditory system can be seen, which was sensitive to speech frequencies. Um, I think that probably Homo heidelbergensis were using this very extensive mic mimicry in the way that I've just been describing for the Bayaka, and that this was starting to develop we intentionality, joint commitment, uh, and uh, sexual uh, and political counter-dominance was starting to emerge. And I think it's unlikely, as Dejew and Levinson have recently argued, that they somehow spoke. Um, 
because, of course, the last stages that enable uh, icons to become symbols is a political social process. It's not a physiological one. And this is supported by Marin and Perry's work on cognitive evolution, proposing that the close, and I quote them, close correspondence between the networks of regions, <coughs> sorry, the close correspondence between networks and regions involved in singing and speaking suggests that speech may have evolved from an already complex system for voluntary control of vocalization. Their divergences suggest that the later evolving aspects of these two uniquely human abilities are essentially hemispheric specializations. Group chorusing to deter predators provides a model in which costly signaling constraints are respected and vocal control is selected for. As increasingly complex forms of vocalizations improved deceptiveness, they provided increasing gendered survival benefits to individuals composing the chorusing group. If music still so powerfully wrenches our emotions and can keep us dancing all night, it may be because we retain a naive costly signal of faith in the honesty of those pitch alterations representing genuine changes in uh, emotions uh, in arousal states. To alternate between fast and slow rhythms when singing or dancing, the singer or dancer has to put in effort to work themselves up. <coughs> Experiencing real changes in bodily and emotional states. Over generations, regularly chorusing at night would have encouraged an improved ability to entrain to pulse or rhythm and potentially the beginnings of vocal learnings. In the context of musical participation, rhythm serves to synchronize actions across large groups of people. Indeed, this could be a modern way of reformulating what Emil Durkheim uh, uh, thought of as the uh, origin of, of human culture, that people in training together, singing in community-wide ritual, established the first collectively shared conceptual repertoires upon which the normative conditions for human culture and society first evolved. While there's no way of knowing to what extent early hominin chorusing resembled contemporary musics, it's likely to have involved rhythmic entrainment and therefore sounded musical to modern ears. Other species entrained to periodic pulse, parrots, fireflies, crickets, frogs, for instance. And these examples have been used to suggest that rhythmic entrainment can emerge easily in biological systems. Tecumseh Fitch remarks that this is the paradox of rhythm. Periodicity and entrainment seem to be among the most basic features of living things, yet the human ability and proclivity to entrain our motor output to auditory stimuli appears to be very rare. So while rhythm is widespread in biological systems, human abilities to entrain exceeds that observed anywhere else. And it's evidence, I think, of an advanced multimodal ability to synchronize action or voice with the perception of river, rhythm something that Anurud Patel argues is key to the neurobiology of complex vocal learning on which language depends. Although we may never know what early hominin chorus sounded like, there are remarkable similarities in the overlapping polyphonic style of the four hunter-gatherer groups I've been discussing today. And, when, uh, and it's quite likely that when we hear them, uh, we're hearing uh, the closest we're likely to get to the original uh, echoes of our forgotten ancestors. <laughs> Thank you.